This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of Holland by George Edmondson. Chapter 17. Chapter Summary. War with France and England. William the Third. Stadtholder. Murder of the Brothers de Witt. 1672. The advance of the French armies and those of the Munster and Cologne to attack the eastern frontier of the United Provinces met with little serious resistance. Fortress after fortress fell. The line of the Issel was abandoned. Soon the whole of the Gelderland, over Issel, Drent, and Utrecht were in the possession of the enemy. Even the castle of Melden, but ten miles from Amsterdam, was only saved from capture at the very last moment, by Jean Maurice throwing himself with a small force within the walls. The Prince of Orange had no alternative but to fall back behind the famous waterline of Holland. He had at his disposal, after leaving garrisons in the fortresses, barely four thousand men as a field force. With some difficulty the people were persuaded to allow the dikes to be cut, as in the height of the struggle against Spain and the country to be submerged. Once more behind the expanse of flood, stretching like a gigantic moat, from Myrden on the Zuyder Zee to Gorkum on the Maas. Holland alone remained as the last refuge of national resistance to an overwhelming foe. True, the islands of Zeeland and Friesland were yet untouched by invasion, but had Holland succumbed to the French armies, their resistance would have availed little. At the end of June, the aspect of affairs looked very black, and despite the courageous attitude of the young captain-general, and the ceaseless energy with which the council pensionary worked for the equipment of an adequate fleet, and the provision of ways and means and stores, there seemed to be no ray of hope. Men's hearts failed them for fear, and a panic of despair filled the land. Had the combined fleets of England and France been able at this moment to attain a victory at sea, and to land an army on the coast, it is indeed difficult to see how utter and complete disaster could have been avoided. Fortunately, however, this was averted. It had been De Witt's hope that De Witte might have been able to have struck a blow at the English ships in the Thames and the Medway before they had time to put to sea and effect a junction with the French. But the Zealand contingent was late, and it was the middle of May before the famous Admiral, accompanied, as in 1667, by Cornelis de Witt, as the representative of the States General, sailed at the head of seventy-five ships, in search of the Anglo-French fleet. After delays through contrary winds, the encounter took place in Southwold Bay on June the 7th. The Duke of York was the English Admiral-in-Chief, Destrée the French commander, and they had a united force of ninety ships. The Dutch, who had the wind-gauge, found the hostile squadrons separated from one another. De Reuter at once took advantage of this. He ordered Vice-Admiral Barkas with the Zeeland squadron to contain the French, while he himself, with the rest of the force, bore down upon the Duke of York. The battle was contested with the utmost courage and obstinacy on both sides, and the losses were heavy. The advantage, however, remained with the Dutch. The English flagship, the Royal James, was burnt, and the Duke was afterwards three times compelled to shift his flag. Both fleets returned to the home ports to refit, and during the rest of the summer and early autumn no further attack was made on De Ritter who with some sixty vessels kept watch and ward along the coasts of Holland and Zeeland. The Dutch admiral had gained his object, and no landing was ever attempted. But the Battle of Southwold Bay, though it relieved the immediate naval danger, could do nothing to stay the advancing tide of invasion on land. The situation appeared absolutely desperate. Trade was at a standstill, and the rapid fall in the state securities and in the East India Company's stock, gave alarming evidence of the state of public opinion. In these circumstances, De Witt, 
persuaded the States-General and the Estates of Holland to consent to the sending of two special embassies to Louis, who was now at Duisburg, and to London to sue for peace. They left The Hague on June the 13th, only to meet with a humiliating rebuff. Charles the Second refused to discuss the question apart from France. Pieter de Groot and his colleagues were received at Duisburg with scant courtesy, and sent back to The Hague to seek for fuller powers. When they arrived, they found the council pensionary lying on a sick bed. The country's disasters had been attributed to the De Witts, and the strong feeling against them led to a double attempt at assassination. John De Witt, while walking home at the close of a busy day's work, was, June the 21st, attacked by four assailants and badly wounded. The leader, Jacob van der Graaf, was seized and executed. The others were allowed to escape, it was said, by the prince's connivance. A few days later, an attack upon Cornelis de Witt at Dordrecht likewise failed to attain its object, that such dastardly acts could happen without an outburst of public indignation, was ominous of worse things to come. It was a sign that the whole country had turned its back upon the States' party, and the whole system of government, of which for nineteen years John de Witt had been the directing spirit, had become orangist. Revolutionary events followed one another with an almost bewildering rapidity. On July the 2nd, the estates of Zeeland appointed William to the office of Stadtholder. The Estates of Holland repealed the Eternal Edict on July the 3rd, and on the next day it was resolved, on the proposal of Amsterdam, to revive the Stadtholdership with all its former powers and prerogatives in favour of the Prince of Orange. The other provinces followed the lead of Holland and Zeeland, and on July the 8th the States General appointed the young Stadtholder Captain and Admiral General of the Union. William thus found himself invested with all the officers, and even more than the authority, that had been possessed by his ancestors. Young and inexperienced as he was, he commanded unbounded confidence, and it was not misplaced. Meanwhile, despite the strong opposition of Amsterdam and some other towns, the fuller powers asked for by de Groot were granted, and he returned to the camp of Louis to endeavour to obtain more favourable terms of peace. He was unsuccessful. The demands of the French king included concessions of territory to Cologne, to Munster, and to England, and for himself the greater part of the Generality lands, with the great fortresses, Herzogenbusch and Maastricht, a war indemnity of sixteen million francs, and complete freedom for Catholic worship. On July the 1st, de Groot returned to The Hague to make his report. The humiliating terms were rejected unanimously, but it was still hoped that now that the Prince of Orange was at the head of affairs, negotiations might be resumed through the mediation of England. William even went so far as to send a special envoy to Charles the Second, offering large concessions to England if the King would withdraw from the French alliance. But it was in vain. On the contrary, at this very time, July the 16th, the treaty between Louis and Charles was renewed, and the demands made on behalf of England were scarcely less exorbitant than those put forward by Louis himself. The cession of Slaes, Valcaran, Cotzin, Verne, and Gorry, an indemnity of twenty-five million francs, the payment of an annual subsidy for the herring fishery, and the striking of the flag. If all the conditions made by the two kings were agreed to, the sovereignty of the remnants of the once powerful United Provinces, impoverished and despoiled, was offered to the Prince. He rejected it with scorn. When the estates of Holland on the return of de Groot asked his advice about the French terms, the Stadtholder replied, All that stands in the proposal is unacceptable. Rather let us be hacked in pieces than accept such conditions. And when an English envoy, after expressing King Charles's personal goodwill to his nephew, tried to persuade him to accept the inevitable, he met with an indignant refusal. But don't you see that the Republic is lost, he is reported to have pleaded. I know of one sure means of not seeing her downfall, was William's proud reply, to die in defence of the last ditch. 
The firm attitude of the prince gave courage to all, and whatever might be the case with the more exposed provinces on the eastern and south-eastern frontiers, the Hollanders and Zeelanders were resolved to sacrifice everything rather than yield without a desperate struggle. But the fact that they were reduced to these dire straits roused the popular resentment against the De Witts, and the system of government which had for more than two decades been in possession of power. Their wrath was especially directed against the council pensionary. Pamphlets were distributed, broadcast in which he was charged, amongst other misdoings, with appropriating public funds for his private use. While yet suffering from the effects of his wounds, De Witt appeared, July 23rd, before the estates, and vigorously defended himself. A unanimous vote declared him free from blame. Cornelis de Witt was no less than his brother, an object of popular hatred. In the town of Dordrecht, where the de Witt influence had been so long supreme, his portrait in the town hall was torn to pieces by the mob, and the head hung on the gallows. On July 24th he was arrested, and imprisoned at the Hague, on the charge brought against him of being implicated in a plot to assassinate the prince, by a barber named Tichla. Tichla was well known to be a bad and untrustworthy character. On the unsupported testimony of this man, the Rouart, though indignantly denying the accusation, was incarcerated in the Gavangaport, to be tried by a commission appointed by the estates. Great efforts were made by his friends, and by his brother, to obtain his release. But, as the prince would not interfere, the proceedings had to take their course. John de Witt, meanwhile, wishing to forestall a dismissal, which he felt to be inevitable, appeared before the estates on August the 4th, and in an impressive speech, voluntarily tendered his resignation of the post of council pensionary, asking only for the redemption of the promise made to him that at the close of his tenure of office he should receive a judicial appointment. The resignation was accepted, the request granted, but owing to opposition no vote of thanks was given. Caspar Fagel was appointed council pensionary in his place. The enemies of John de Witt were not content with his fall from power. A committee of six judges was impanelled to try his brother, Cornelis, for his alleged crime. On August the 17th, to their eternal disgrace, they, by a majority vote, ordered the prisoner, who was suffering from gout, to be put to the torture. The illustrious victim of their malice endured the rack without flinching, insisting on his absolute innocence of any plot against the prince's life. Nevertheless, early on August 19th, sentence was pronounced upon him of banishment and loss of all his officers. Later on the same day, Cornelis sent a message to his brother that he should like to see him. John, in spite of strong warnings, came to the Gavangaput, and was admitted to the room where the Ruad, as a result of the cruel treatment he had received, was lying in bed, and the two brothers had a long conversation. Meanwhile, a great crowd had gathered round the prison, clamouring for vengeance upon the De Witts. Three companies of soldiers were, however, drawn up under the command of Count Tilly, with orders from the commissioned councillors to maintain order. At the same time, the Schuterich, the civic guard, was called out. These latter, however, were not to be trusted, and were rather inclined to fraternise with the mob. So long as Tilly's troops were at hand, the rioters were held in restraint, and no acts of violence were attempted. It was at this critical moment that verbal orders came to Tilly to march his troops to the gates to disperse some bands of marauding peasants, who were said to be approaching. Tilly refused to move without a written order. It came, signed by Van Asperen, the president of the commissioned councillors, a strong orange partisan. On receiving it, Tilly is said to have exclaimed, I will obey, but the De Witts are dead men. The soldiers were no sooner gone than the crowd under the leadership of Verhoof, a goldsmith, and Van Bankham, a banker, forced the door of the prison, the Huterich, 
either standing aloof or actually assisting in the attack, and rushing upstairs found John de Witt sitting calmly at the foot of his brother's bed, reading aloud to him a passage of scripture. Hands were laid upon both with brutal violence. They were dragged into the street, and there with blows of clubs and repeated stabs done to death. It was four p.m. when Tilly departed. At four-thirty all was over but the infuriated rabble were not content with mere murder. The bodies were shamefully mishandled, and were finally hung up by the feet to a lamp-post, round which, to a late hour in the evening, a crowd shouted, sang, and danced. It is impossible to conceive a fate more horrible, or less deserved. The poor dishonoured remains were taken down when night fell, by few faithful hands, and were at dawn in the presence of a few relatives and friends, interned in the Neue Kirk. That William the Third had any complicity in this execrable fact, as it was well styled by the new council pensionary Fagel, there is not the slightest evidence. He was absent from the Hague at the time, and wholly preoccupied with the sore necessities of the military position, and it is said that he was much affected at hearing the dreadful news but his natural cold and self-contained nature had been hardened in the school of adversity during the long years of humiliation which had been imposed upon him by john de witt and his party he had endured in proud patience awaiting the hour when he could throw off the yoke now that it had come he could not forgive under the plea that the number of those implicated in the deed was so large that it was impossible to punish them and thus stir up party passions at a time when the whole energies of the nation were needed for the war, he took no steps to bring the offenders to justice. Unfortunately for his reputation, he was not content with a neutral attitude, but openly protected and rewarded the three chief offenders, Tichela, the Hoof, and Van Bankham, all of them men of disreputable character. Thus two of the greatest statesmen and patriots that Holland has produced, John van Alden Banvelt and John de Witt, both perished miserably, victims of the basest national ingratitude. And it will ever remain a stain upon the national annals, and upon the memory of two illustrious princes of Orange, Maurice and William the Third, that these tragedies were not averted. End of chapter 17